I want to welcome everyone. We're going to start um, to our third space lecture. And we are um, going to introduce, um, after I say, everyone probably knows me already. I'm Gloria Kondrup and the executive director of the Hoffman Smokin Center for Typography. And we're doing this in conjunction with the graphic design department. Um, I have to thank uh, my staff, Clifford and Alan Zhu, who's the uh, graphic design student who's behind creating all the brands for our um, program. So thank you, Alan, wave and say goodbye. <laughs> He's great. Um, and I wanna introduce Ty Drake. Ty Drake, Professor Drake is the faculty director for GX MGX and our new spatial graphics track. So um, he will introduce Dan who, I'm, I'm gonna let Ty introduce you and say what your title is. I do have to say Dan was a former student, <laughs> <laughs> as was Ty. Uh, we, you took my packaging class, I remember. I did, yeah. And you did a project called Pearl. That's right. Um, you've come a far away from Pearl right now. So I'm gonna <laughs> let Ty introduce you and I wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, Ty, I'm gonna turn it over to you so you can introduce our wonderful guest and uh, yourself, if you want to, and talk about your program and talk about, I'm curious to see what you're gonna talk about, Dan, as always. So thank you both and I'm disappearing and I'll reappear towards the end. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Gloria. Um, hello everybody and welcome to our third installation of the Space Lecture Series and absolutely excited to have um, Dan Goods here today to talk about the work that he does at JPL um, and folk and give you some a little bit of insight on how um, graphic design and space actually come together. Um, as we continue to develop and program the area of, of, of spatial graphics and typography in our in our department, the idea here is to give you all um, a lot more insight into what the possibilities are. I know most people are familiar with our traditional graphic design tracks of print, packaging, and now with the transmedia program, which is going really, really well, uh, we're branching out. And I think the idea here is that we're rethinking uh, what spatial graphics are now, right? As opposed to what it used to be. I mean, when I was here in the 90s, it was completely different than what it is now. There's so many possibilities for you guys. And so, our guest today will give you an idea of what that kind of looks like. You know what I mean? So uh, just really quickly, and, I'll let, and I'm gonna get into this um, and let Dan take over. Um, so Dan leads an extraordinary team of creatives called the, called the Studio at NASA's JPL or Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where, um, where they transfer complex concepts into meaningful stories. Really important, meaningful stories, meaningful stories that can be universally understood. The work is seen in public spaces, art museums, and is in outer space, hence the name. Um, I was, or so Dan was honored with uh, NASA's Exceptional Public Service Award and somehow was selected as, this is really cool, one of the most interesting people in Los Angeles by, by the LA Weekly in 2002. Dan, that's, I've never had that honor ever. <laughs> the most interesting people in Los Angeles, really? Dude, <laughs> it was strange. It was strange. Wow. <laughs> All right. So Dan graduated valedictorian. That's probably why you got that honor from the graphic design program at Art Center College of Design. And he currently lives in Altadena with his wife, three kids, seven chickens, two beehives, and a beautiful dog. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> so uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Dan. Dan, uh, I'm going to mute my um, microphone, but I'll be visible with video. Um, and so go ahead and go through your thing. And then at the end, you guys, you guys hold your questions to the end. You can obviously put your questions in the chat, um, which we'll be monitoring, but we're going to save a little bit of time at the end to ask questions. I'm going to go first with a couple of questions I have for Dan, and then we will look at some of the questions from the chat. All right. So with, uh, without any further ado, uh, the most interesting man in Los Angeles <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a while ago, but hopefully, hopefully I'm still interesting. And I don't know what week you guys are at Art Center, but uh, hopefully you're still awake. And, uh, and this will be fun together. Uh, I always like to 
sort of give a little bit of background of, of where where I came from, because, uh, you know, we all have different stories and, and um, you know, your story is important. Uh, all of our stories are important. And uh, but like in high school, all through high school, I never took an art class in my life. I was never the person that drew in the, in the corner. I didn't even think about art at all. Like that was never, never part of my, um, you know, my vocabulary or within my family or anything like that. But uh, I was really into sports. And so I, if you know what fantasy football is, well, I was, I was part of like the old school fantasy football uh, teams. And, and um, my friends and I, well, I, I started to work at a place that was like Kinko's before Kinko's was, was around. And so it was the only place in my whole town of Salem, Oregon, where you could take a photograph, scan it in, and then print it out. But it cost like 150 bucks, and it was a big process. And but it was like really cool. And so uh, since I worked there, I was sort of volunteering my time. Uh, they kind of let me play around and, and do different things. And so I started to make logos and newsletters for our fantasy football league. And I have with me right now. So these are like really old. So these are right out of high school. So these would have been like 93. So this is the Salem Fantasy Football League the SFFL, right? We And, and uh, all my stuff was on a floppy disk, right? right? I don't know why it says Montana, but it does. And so look at this. In our newsletter, we had a photograph from that week. And I was called Acid Rain. And my friend was Primetime Pirates and the Revengers. And, you know, we, we named our league with Earth, Wind and Fire. And, you know, and then we then we had all the stats from the week. And, and um, then we'd have like people talk about who they thought was going to win the next week. But anyways, like I made, you know, every every week I would make one of these newsletters. And oh, man, you designed all these. I designed all these. Yeah. And, you know, like you go cool. from the first one to the next one and, you know, like there's big differences. Right. It's, it's <laughs> made made some, uh, you know, uh, uh, innovations over over time. But so that was a long time ago. Right. But when the person that ran that that store he had been a comic book artist and he was sort of a mentor of mine we'd go outside in the evenings and he would smoke and i'd sort of stand the opposite direction of the wind and um and we'd just kind of talk about stuff and and one evening he said dan have you ever thought about going to an art school and i just laughed i was like no <laughs> that's the last thing i'd ever imagined doing in my life and uh he said you know what i see that you like to put things together and uh, you might think about that sometime. And so I was like, whatever. <laughs> right? But I went home and I kid you not, on my bed that day was a postcard from a little place called uh, the Art Institute of Seattle. And so I went to one of those, I, I call them the McArt schools <laughs> up in Seattle. And um, and people, I didn't know why I was there. I, I was there six months after that conversation. I had called up Art Center and they said, yeah, you're not right. You're not ready for Art Center right now. And so anyways, uh, I went on and, and um, I, I didn't know how to paint, draw, do anything. People asked me, why are you there? And I was like, I don't know, but I like to put things together. And once we finally got to uh, you know, ideas and and actually putting, you know, uh, various things together, then I started to do well. And then um, eventually I, I started to graphic, I, I started to freelance as graphic designer. I got a job, got married, thought like life was set. And then I got laid off. And I was like, really bummed. But I knew that whole time that I was not that good of a designer. And I always had in the back of my mind, and I wish I could go, you know, someplace and get better and, and perhaps art center. And, and so when I when I uh, had been laid off, I was talking to my you know, new wife um, and about what what to do next in life. And I was either going to start a tea house because I love the ceremony of of thinking about every little tiny part of what goes into that. I didn't really care about tea, but I just like the ceremony of it. Um, or I was going to join the Peace Corps because I love the idea of doing something meaningful uh, with my life. Um, or if I could get into Art Center that um, and get a scholarship, had have both of those things, then then we'd go there. And uh, somehow I got in, and so we we moved from Seattle down to. Los Angeles. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen. And so uh, driving down from uh, Seattle uh, in our big rider van, 
I remember seeing these two signs and I was like, oh my goodness, it's Art Center College of Design. I'd always wanted to go there. And I was so excited to see that sign. And then literally right next to it, you know, this is on the 210, there's this NASA JPL sign. And I was like, whoa, you know, I've kind of heard about this place. I don't really know what it is. It's sort of mysterious. And um, I, I thought, you know, it'd be amazing to someday get to like peek in there and see what's going on but never expecting that I would ever get to you know, do anything there. Well, so I ended up studying graphic design at, at Art Center. And uh, eventually I bumped into uh, this guy, which um, uh, this is Roland Young. He uh, unfortunately just passed away uh, just, uh, just recently, but uh, he was the kind of person that, you know, I, I hope that you get to meet someone like this in your life. I've only met a couple of people like him to where he he really can see inside of your soul. And, and I like to describe it where he can reach inside of your, your chest and just like rip out your soul and for a moment show you who you actually are. And so he, uh, what I was doing was an independent study with him. Uh, for this place called Galco's, which is in Eagle Rock, and they sell 500 kinds of soda. And I was trying to do what I thought a good gra graphic designer was supposed to be able to do, which is to make a logo. And turns out that I'm awful at making logos. And so, so he saw that I was struggling and, and he's, he said, Dan, you're just too practical. And you're so practical that it keeps you confined in, in a box. And, and he said, you need to go play because you are so practical that you'll take the impractical things that you do and you will make them practical. And I, I didn't, I was trying to follow along what he was saying, but um, I thought, hey, he told me to go play. I'm gonna go do that. And so um, I wanted to play with the bottle, the glass bottle, because that's what makes this place unique. That's what makes, uh, they all of their, their uh, sodas is, is in the glass bottle. And so if you want like a, a root beer, there's 50 kinds of root beer. And if you want an orange soda, there's 30 kinds of orange soda. And, um, but the bottle is the essence because that's what makes the soda taste good because they use sugar cane instead of corn syrup and it's in a bottle versus aluminum. And so I just started to play with bottles and I thought, oh, you know, what if I glued a whole bunch of them together and I hung them up somehow? And what if I lit them from behind? And, and then I thought, well, what if you put these on top of the building? So as you drive along, you would see this, you know, this place and you would understand what it's about. And I love the way in which bottles make noise when you blow on them, right? And so I thought, you know, what if I drove around town with these on top of my car? Would they make music? And uh, it says, does not work, but it looks pretty cool. Um, I, I'm sort of tenacious. And so I got my friend and it's like, hey, you know, can you do this thing? Kind of push it up and down and see if that will work. And that didn't work, but eventually got the right angle and the right distance. And it made this beautiful noise at about 25 miles an hour and go, woo, 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 woo. And I thought, oh man, wouldn't it be cool to make a taco truck stand? So just like an ice cream truck, you know, you can hear it coming. And what if, what if we uh, could do that? Um, and then a friend of mine, uh, she had perfect pitch and she went around all these bottles and, and gave me a scale. And I know nothing about music, but I thought, hey, you know, what if I made a pipe organ? And so again, I still can't draw. <laughs> and uh, this is, this is me sort of getting uh, the idea across. And um uh, uh, but this is sort of like the, the story of my life is that I usually have no idea how to do anything that I'm trying to do. But I find that if you ask enough questions and you talk to the right people, you get the right team, then you can do a lot of things that you may never have imagined that you can do. And so in my grad show, uh, the picture with, with uh, Roland there, I had a real pipe organ and I had all these experiments that I'd done that were not anything, you know, there, there were no, you know, I didn't have the logo and I didn't have the poster, but I had all this other stuff that that really got me excited and would have been things I never would have imagined had I just kind of gone through the normal process. And what's kind of wild is uh, that's what got me, this project is what got me into um, an internship at Caltech. And then uh, what also got me into uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And so um, you guys are, are right nearby, it's right, right down the hill. And um, uh, there's about 7,000 people at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and um, many of them are uh, engineers and, and scientists. And, and uh, if you guys you know, hopefully saw this uh, a little while ago, landing on Mars uh, for who knows how many times now, quite a few times. Um, but these are my friends making, making these parts. Um, this was really cool to be able to 
see that this time we brought a helicopter along and I got to be part of the pitching process of sort of pitching this idea of a helicopter and nobody thought we could we could fly a helicopter on Mars and and now it's had a whole bunch of different um, sorties so far. I can't remember if it's like 40 or, or so, something like that. It's a whole bunch. Um, but these um, images are really amazing to see. Uh, these things that are like the edge of possibility, the edge of what is is possible is, is really what JPL is all about. Um, and then, you know, we go to other planets, but we also have um, telescopes that look at stars and galaxies far away. We have an instrument that's on one of the cameras on the JWST mission. And then uh, most people don't know, but we we study the Earth. And so um, there's, uh, there's about 20 satellites that help us understand earthquakes and hurricanes and ocean and, um, you know, all sorts, uh, sorts of different aspects of the earth. And, um, so this is, uh, you know, when I first got there, I was, I was all alone. I was there, uh, for about eight years before I had, uh, an actual employee and then, and then sort of built up over time. And, uh, some, some of the folks are, uh, from art center, others are from other places, but we all have sort of different backgrounds and, um, uh, but we we all love to uh, tell amazing stories and do uh, do high level work, and so um, and we also love love this place of the Jet Propulsion Lab, and we we talk about um, sort of a, a couple different uh, phrases as sort of how we sort of organize ourselves is that we help people think through their thinking, and we also do projects that are sneaking up on learning, and so the helping people think through their thinking that's that's all about. Uh, the idea of of um, of doing workshops and brainstorms. We're we're at the very beginning when people are first imagining what a mission is all about, and uh, it's just the power of having someone else in the room that thinks differently than you. You know, it's not that we're special or anything. We're just like different than everyone else that they're talking to, and so a lot of times we ask the really simple, basic questions like, "Why should I care?" Uh, what does this thing mean? Um, you know, why, why are we spending all this money on it? And uh, so, so that's that's a really meaningful part of the work that that we do here. And then this other area. So, so when I first got to JPL, they were talking about trying to find planets around other stars, and uh, that was hard for me to sort of. I mean, I kind of knew that there were some planets out there, but um, they had found maybe a, a, a few hundred at the time. Uh, and then they were saying they're trying to find an Earth-like planet around other stars. And I was like, I don't know, that sounds pretty, that's pretty crazy. But then they'd give me all these numbers, big numbers that I couldn't comprehend. And, um, and so I had to sort of create something for myself to understand what they were talking about. And so what this is, is uh, this is a grain of sand in the center, the black thing. And then if you see a little tiny light area in there, that's a hole that I had them drill into the grain of sand. So if the grain of sand represents the Milky Way galaxy, that's where we, we live. You know, you see the pinwheel and, and it's, uh, um, it has hundreds of billions of stars in it. Uh, within this little teeny tiny area of our galaxy, so far now we have found about 5,000 planets around other stars. And the reason why we haven't found more is because um, you, uh, it's just that our technology isn't all that great. And so we're gonna find tens of thousands of planets within this little tiny area, let alone the rest of the galaxy. And then uh, if you wanna show all the other galaxies that we know about, you'd need uh, 60 rooms full of sand to show all the other galaxies that we know about. And so this is uh, one of the first projects I did when I got here. And uh, so I'd have this under a magnifying glass and you'd you'd look down there and some people feel really insignificant. Um, I hope you feel actually that, that uh, what we have here is really significant, um, that this earth that we live on is special and precious and we need to uh, take care of it. So after that, um, you know, I'd always been interested in, in these planets around other stars. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen these, but these are the NASA Travel Bureau. Uh, it's something that we created here at, at JPL uh, on our team. And, and uh, so these are a whole bunch of travel posters um, that talk about all these different areas that uh, places that we're, we're exploring and learning about. But hey, Dan, can I ask a question about those posters really quickly? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, did you, with that poster series, uh, did you design those or did you, did, and the, the illustration and the design, is that you or did you collaborate with other people in your, in your, on your team for the, on these? So it's a, it's a big, uh, it was a big group of people. So uh, David Delgado, who's on, on, on the team, he sort of led, uh, him and I led the effort. Uh, he, he, he led it for the most part, and then I, I helped make it all happen. Okay. And uh, we worked with, uh, there's one illustrator, Joby Harris, who did the first uh, sort of set of them. And then we uh, worked with a whole bunch of other illustrators to do the rest of them. So it was a big, uh, big process and a lot of people involved. Okay. And uh, just to kind of give you a sense of like, sometimes, you know, you, you, you imagine when you see things that are out there that, oh, there must have been like a top down view of like, this is a way something's going to happen. But it was actually what was happening was that there was an empty hallway that was really boring. And there was a famous scientist who was going to be coming in uh, over the summer. And they said, hey, could you decorate the hallway? And we're like, okay, well, let's de decorate the hallway. And this had been a relatively new building. And these um, little plastic things, nobody had ever used them, but they were made for posters in front of each of these conference rooms. And so Joby Harris, who's on our team, uh, he had this idea of, you know, why don't we do posters there? And then David had this really cool idea inside. He was like, you know, we could show a picture of the spacecraft, but that'll be kind of boring. Um, what if what if we think about this differently? And, and he really had this, this idea of, you know, back in the 30s, 1930s, um, places were really hard to get to, right? And and they had, uh, there are all these travel posters to places that seemed impossibly far away. And, and they made you yearn for those places, right? And so what if we could do the same, uh, but with these, you know, planets and planets around other stars? And one of the wild things about each of these places is that they're, they're all so different. They're so much different than, than Earth. And um, so... Uh, so again, just like trying to find the essence of Galcos, which is the bottle, we were trying to find the essence of each one of these exoplanets, these planets around other stars. And so um, there are stars that have multiple suns. So if you saw Tatooine and in, in Star Wars as multiple sunsets, well, that's real, right? And so what would be different? You'd have a couple of shadows, right? Um, there's, there's some planets that are around stars that are much different than our sun. So the light coming from our sun, if you look at our trees and grass, everything is green. If you were around this sun, if it had trees and grass, everything would be red, which is totally different, right? It's, it's, it's wild. And then uh, other ones are just like really, really gigantic. And so there's a lot of gravity. And so if you were to do some sort of extreme sports, then you'd, you'd be going really fast because the gravity is a lot different. And so these are the first ones that we put together and they were just meant for the hallway. And, and we tried to think of ourselves as travel agents and uh, being sort of goofy about it. So Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. And relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. And so, you know, they're a little corny and, and funky, but um, the whole process here is we we ended up having big groups of people in brainstorms, and we would again try to find the essence of each one of these places. And then uh, David would put together a slide that would be like this, and and he would say, okay, well, um, this is a, what I loved about this one was that. The scientists didn't want to do this one because because this one doesn't have a sun. So if you're a travel agent, how do you get someone to go someplace that doesn't have a sun? And um, and so fortunately, David has a advertising background, and and they're always trying to make, take take a negative and make it a positive. And so and this one, it's where the nightlife never ends, right? And so he put together this little board as a as a mood board for each of the different uh, things, and then uh, Joby would go in and do a whole bunch of different illustrations, and um, you know eventually we would get to the point that you know you'd have the actual. Uh, the actual poster. And, and uh, we've done lots of different types of things with these. Um, you can, if you Google NASA travel posters, you can download them, uh, print them out 10 feet large if you want. Uh, we ended up doing this at the Arroyo Seco Festival, where we ended up hanging them all over the place. But then we we wanted to make like 
some of these things into like selfie stations. And so uh, the one on the right is the one where it was, um, you know, where, where the grass is always right around the other side. And so, so people got to go in there, they got to, you know, hang out within these posters, which is fun. Um, this <laughs> uh, people at festivals wear interesting outfits. Uh, this person dressed up as a giant polar bear. Um, but this is about uh, uh, Europa. Europa is a, is a is a moon around Jupiter that has an ocean that has twice as much water as there is on Earth. Uh, but it's it's covered in this giant ice shell. And so it's really cool is that we got to talk to all these people that were at a music festival festival, not expecting to bump into someone from NASA, but to learn about these these other places. And then one of the funny things about the way in which the posters were made is that the logo was sort of outside of the artwork. So all the things that NASA makes is, is public domain. So you can take the posters and kind of do whatever you want to with them. And so people are selling all sorts of stuff with our posters on them. We don't get any money from it, but as long as they don't have the NASA logo on it, they can kind of do what they want. Uh, they're in lots of TV shows and movies as, as backgrounds. Um, this is one of my favorites here at JPL. Even the, the janitor wanted them up in, in their... Um, in their office and and that's what i i love that i love it when when the work speaks to everyone right you you don't have to be a, a space nerd you can you can be anybody and and like the work for different reasons and and eventually uh th this was an email that i got that i loved is i'd like to acquire the posters so i can hang them in our child's nursery my wife isn't pregnant now but we plan to start trying in the next few months i'd like my son to, and daughter to grow up uh, dreaming big. And so love that he he gave me maybe a little bit too much information, but, but it, um, we love to be able to make that sort of an impact on people's lives. So this is mission control at JPL. It's where all the data from any spacecraft that's at the moon or beyond. And there's like 40 of them from all sorts of different countries, from India, from Japan, from uh, European Union, obviously from NASA, and all that data goes through that one room. And then I get a live feed from that room. And when lights come down, that means that we're receiving data from a spacecraft. And when lights go up, that means that we're sending data to a spacecraft. And then the amount of light you see represents how much information is going back and forth. And so um, every 20 seconds, we listen to a different spacecraft, and you get a sense of what's going on. And so Voyager, which is uh, over 45 years old, it's beyond the edge of the solar system, there's two of them, uh, it can hardly send any data back and forth. So it sort of looks like it's broken sometimes. Um, uh, but other spacecraft are sending lots and lots of data back and forth. And so this is in the main administration building at, at JPL. And uh, part of this, I had to figure out like, how do I, how do we make it where you get the sense of all this information that's coming back and forth, but you could still read the type. And so uh, we had this tool that was made. So it was a software tool so that we could change the amount of LEDs that would be in the uh, in every level, uh, each ring of, of this thing, um, so that we could make sure that you could see it from a distance when you're walking up to it, uh, when there's a lot of data and when, when there's no data. And so it was kind of fun to try to figure out how the typography would work. Um, when the original director uh, retired, we ended up making a baby version of it. So he has this at, at Caltech in his office. Uh, this is a picture of Jupiter. So if you remember, Jupiter has the eye, right? The eye of Jupiter. And, and it is so big that the eye of Jupiter, you can fit two Earths within the eye of Jupiter. So it is enormous. And this is uh, um, uh, a picture from the Juno spacecraft. And Juno, um, it, uh, it launched... Well, I can't even remember when it launched. It launched a long time ago. And before it launched, they they were asking us, well, hey, you know what? We don't have a big enough rocket to go all the way to Jupiter. What we're going to do is we're going to go out towards Mars, and then we were going to um, bring it back towards the Earth, and we're going to get really, really close to the Earth, and we're going to use the Earth as a slingshot to sling us all the way out to Jupiter. And so we have this opportunity to do something to connect people to this spacecraft in some way. And we were thinking about various kinds of social media, 
Um, but you know, we kind of we kind of went really old school. And if you remember what ham radio operators do with uh, with Morse code, it's like dee 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 dee. We kind of went old school with that, and I'm going to show you a little video about it. This is my uh, transmitter. Maybe it's some something you can use. Uh... Juno experiment is something that a group of us came up with. The biggest challenge we had was we didn't know if this was going to work or not. If it works, you know, I'm part of history. <laughs> this is W6JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Hello, CQ, CQ, CQ. flyby is Juno's way of gaining some extra speed and changing direction so that its orbit can take it to Jupiter. He said, what if we actually sent something to Juno? I basically came up with the idea that we could send Morse code to Juno, enlist the support of amateur radio operators around the world. So the intent is to join amateur radio community together in a coordinated transmission from Earth to the Juno spacecraft as it flies by. The website would tell them, okay, key down now, then key up, transmit for 30 seconds. And that's how we would send a dit. Everybody knows Morse code is dit, 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 da, da. Well, it turns out to say hi to Juno, it takes four dits, and space, and then two dits for the eye. I thought, wow, that's a neat thing to do, and they're gonna need a lot of people to pull this thing off. I said, I'm good to go. We're getting ready right now. Here we go. And now we are transmitting here. They could hear ham radio operators all over the world doing this, which was really remarkable. Everybody's doing this at the same time. Thousands and thousands of hams. With any luck, the Juno spacecraft will be able to listen and hear all these amateur radio transmissions. And so what we're doing now is we're looking at the data that's come down to see if we can put together that signal that says, hi, will it work? Who knows? the audio from Juno. I'd love you to listen to it. This sounds very cool. Actually worked and hurt us. When you think about what it is, it was really, really amazing. How many times do you get to say hi to a spacecraft that's made by your plan? To be a part of it, that was very great. More than thinking about what it means to me, I think it's, it's just such a great thing that humankind has the ability to think beyond our own environment. It's the curiosity, it's the adventuring spirit, I think the space program has given us. Hi Juno! Hi Juno! Hi Juno! Hi Juno! Hi Juno! Hi Juno! Goodbye, thank you! <laughs> okay, take 17. So that was that was a lot of fun to be able to be part of, and uh, especially because that was at a time when uh, the government had shut down. And in fact, it was illegal for us to tell anybody about it. Uh, but fortunately, that community is really tight knit, and um, and they did it anyway as well. Everyone else was bickering. <laughs>
Um, so those are, you know, those are projects that uh, I've done here at, at JPL, and um, uh, but I also do a bunch of other projects outside of JPL, and um, uh, you you got to hear from Nick a little while ago. I don't know how much he talked about the eCloud, but uh, I thought maybe I'd, I'd kind of give some behind the scenes of how that happened, and and so Nick and Nick Hoffermas and Aaron Koblen and I somehow none of us had ever done a public art project in our life um but a friend of mine who sort of wins all these public art uh calls uh said that i should submit and i was like hey but you know i nobody knows who i am and i haven't done anything and why would anyone pick us and um he said no no you you got to do it and i'm going to be out of the country anyways so i can't win so <laughs> so uh we all submitted and uh this is uh for san jose for for their new airport and uh and we got selected to do a hanging sculpture of course i'd never done a hanging sculpture before um but uh we we kept thinking about clouds because that's my favorite part of flying is when is just looking at the clouds uh, going up and through them and and we're trying to figure out well so if this is going to be a sculpture that's going to be there for like 10 years and it's in silicon valley so it needs to feel like it's digital in some way but the problem with digital is that things get you know they look old as soon as they come out right and and so if we use a uh, whatever the fancy tech was at, at that time, uh, within a year or two, it looked kind of old. And then by 10 years, you know, nobody would care about it. And so we kept looking around for what could make something feel like a cloud. And we found this material, it's called liquid crystal. And uh, if you have a piece, it's, it's normally opaque, but if you add electricity, it becomes transparent. And so if you can switch between those two states, just think of it as a pixel, right? And and actually that is how your your screen works is it's full of uh, liquid crystal. And so Aaron did this great little um, uh, rendering at the very beginning, trying to give us a sense of, you know, if we had an array of all these different pixels, uh, what could we do with it? And could we, could we make uh, imagery of some sort? And then we started to think, well, you know, this thing's kind of a, a long hallway and how do we, how do we give the sense of a cloud just by the you know the orientation of of all these different pixels and uh then we started to try to test ideas on how this was working and and we had all sorts of challenges it was really hard for us to figure out how to get these things to work in fact uh this one only worked because uh we had light bulbs attached to it and we thought you know what you know we, we can't have you know ten thousand light bulbs attached uh just so our our liquid crystal would work but eventually I found the right person who who actually happened to work at JPL and he 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 knew how to work with low, low power objects because that's what he has to do at, at JPL. And so he figured out how to sort of um, change the opacity and uh, then custom design circuit boards. And um, we even got to put our little name on there. And um but the problem is, is that this thing's supposed to be big, right? And we never really got to see what it would look like until, you know, we're like partway through and and uh, these things are all expensive. But when we finally got to see it like this, we we're like, oh man, there's potential here. We can, we can probably do something with this. And so um, we had to do a whole bunch of other design stuff of how how the power and the data would, would run. Uh, I made this little, you know, mock up in my garage trying to figure out how are we going to hang all this stuff and um, found we, we, we had a really hard time finding out how to hang all these things in a way that didn't look like a giant concert stage uh, because all the engineers wanted to put really heavy uh, uh, sort of truss systems and, and Nick found this amazing architect that came up with a way of having these really long V channels so that we could uh, hide all of our electronics, but also the V-shape uh, was really, really strong, so it could hold uh, a lot of weight. And then with all these pixels, they all had to have wires, and well, how many wires are there going to, are you just going to see nothing but wires? And so we had to kind of test all that, uh, worked with a great firm to um, figure out how to rig it and put it together. And Jamie Barlow had the unfortunate uh, job of going around and, and sort of numbering every single one of these because they were sort of randomly numbered and he'd say okay do 635 okay oh it's over there okay where's 637 i don't know 
And uh, they all had blue stuff on it because we didn't want, because uh, if you took it off, there's a good chance we'd damage it. So really we never got, oh, this is Aaron kind of playing with, <laughs> uh, with the actual computer coding on a really tiny thing. But we never really got to see it until, you know, we got it up there, which is really uh, scary because, you know, you're doing this big project, your first one that's going to be uh, big at an airport and lots of people are going to see it, but you don't even know what it looks like. And so, um, uh, you know, this is sort of the, the final installation phase. And so finally, when it's finally in there, we finally got to see, you know, these things go on and off and, and we, you know, almost cried. It was like, oh, I'm so thankful it, it actually works. It was really a scary moment, but uh, this is what, um, this is sort of our little sizzle video. And the idea here is that um, we're tracking weather data from around the world. And so every 20 seconds, we get weather from a different city in the world and the weather in that city affects the patterns that you would see. So we had this display that um, looked like an iPhone before an iPhone came out. And uh, so now everyone go, goes and tries to touch it, but it, it's not <laughs> interactive, but it, it tells you the next uh, set of cities that we're going to be looking at, and it tells you which city and, and the uh, the weather and, and stuff in that city, and then you can sort of see how that city's weather affects it. So if it's raining somewhere, it'll look like it's raining or windy or snowy or stormy, or if it's LA, it just kind of sits there. We don't have any weather, except for... Uh, yesterday. So that was exciting. <laughs> so that was the eCloud. Again, uh, Nick and, and Aaron Koblen were, were great uh, people to work with. Um, here's another project that uh, ended up working on in, um, or is it, is in, uh, in Utah. And they gave us this uh, big wall. And literally, the like week and a half before the presentation, they had told us that they wanted a hanging sculpture. And so we had all these ideas for hanging sculptures. And then they they called us up and said, hey, you know what? Actually, the architects told us that the plane, the integrity of the plane of the ceiling is really important. And so we can't really hang anything. And, uh, and we're like, what? I don't even know what that means, but basically you can't hang anything. And then they said, well, yeah, and we don't really want anything on the wall either. And we're like, We've been working with you for like four months and now you're gonna like tell us that you don't want anything on the ceiling and nothing on the wall, but you still want us to do something there. And they're like, yeah, you know, you could, you're creative. <laughs> and so uh, we were sort of bummed, but we, we'd always love, like I love having lunch outside with with a glass of water and watching how the water reacts, right? And And so we thought, what if we did something bigger? And so we got a big tray of water and we started to play around with, with light and how, how you, so the light is above this tray of water and uh, seeing what sort of patterns that we could create. And it's funny because we were using really weird things like pool noodles and weird objects from Home Depot. <laughs> so this is David Delgado, he's, he's um, uh, playing around with the water. Um, but we're trying to figure out, well, how are we gonna do this without us having to move you know, the pool noodle around all the time. And, and so we thought about a robot, but a robot was going to be too expensive for our, for our uh, budget. But we met this guy who was a lighting designer. He was actually an unemployed lighting designer. <laughs> so he had lots of, lots of time. And he said, hey, you know what? These DJ lights are robots, right? Just get rid of the light. And it, and it does everything that you want it to do. And so it turns out that we, it was true. So this, this thing was like 200 bucks. We put a PVC pipe on the end. And so then we could control how much and when and where we wanted all the, the pattern making to happen. And so then we ended up um, trying to figure out, well, where's the ceiling? So uh, the line across there is the ceiling and trying to figure out how high up uh, a light had to be in order for it to work and uh, where you could put all the electronics and and all all those different aspects of things. And this is what it ended up looking like. And uh, this is actually at the um, the gallery, Williamson Gallery at some point uh, some years ago. But uh, what's really amazing is people like to go up and try to touch it, even though there's nothing to actually touch. Um, but 
at the end of the day, there was nothing hanging from the ceiling and there was nothing on the wall. So we, uh, we ended up making the brief, <laughs> but just barely. So I'm just going to finish uh, with one one last thing here. Um, so, so I I one time was listening to a friend of mine. His name is Erwin McManus, and uh, he said it is a gift and a privilege to be alive. And I didn't hear anything else he said before or after that, but that phrase has always meant something to me. And uh, when I when I do my work, I, I'm thinking about that. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm thinking about that. And uh, there's this little experiment that I like to do. It's called a cloud chamber. I'm going to just show a little video of it. And uh, I hope it speaks to you. This is something called a cloud chamber. And it really is like a fish tank with, um, with some other stuff. And so what I have is there's a metal plate on top of here. And underneath, I have some dry ice. I always like dry ice, right? And uh, so it's super cold. You want to make sure you wear your gloves. So this is underneath of a metal plate. And then inside the fish tank, I put isopropyl alcohol. And if you Google cloud chamber, you can find a bunch of different videos on this. This is just the way I've done it. So you put some isopropyl alcohol in here. You turn the fish tank upside down. You make it really cold down there. And after a little while, you'll see a little fog. And so there's fog that's about, you know, about that high up from the, the base and just kind of going like this. And it's not the fog that's most important. It's actually little streaks. You'll see these little teeny streaks as if they're like, well, I don't have very much hair, but uh, <laughs> like little hairline streaks going through this thing. And these streaks are particles that have come from exploded stars. And they've been flying through space. And some of them get to our solar system. And some of them get to Earth. And some of them get to Los Angeles. And some of them are flying through right this second and are going to smash into this thing. And for a fraction of a second, you'll see something that is invisible. But it's made visible by this. And if you remember from high school, of course, I slept through this class, but I was told <laughs> that our bodies are made of atoms. Atoms that used to be in a star that exploded. And then there was another star that exploded and another star exploded. And all this dust, all these atoms just kind of went all over the place. And at some point, a bunch of them bumped into each other, smashed and smashed, and it became big. And then it became hot. And that became our sun. Some of the other atoms, some of the other dust smashed together and it became our planets and asteroids and comets. Some atoms on Earth became water or the fish or the animals. But it just so happens at this moment in galactic history, some of these atoms have become you. Some of them have become me. It is a gift and a privilege to be alive. What you do matters. What you do matters. What we all do together matters. And it's things like this that when I wake up in the morning, it just kind of whispers this little voice inside of my head and it asks, what are you doing? What are you doing with your brief moment in time?
Wow. All done. <laughs> yeah, so we got about 10 minutes. Um, so uh, I'm getting some wows already, just like I just said. Um, so uh, I, there's a couple of questions uh, where more particularly a comment that I want to make about um, the work that you do. Um, there's there's some takeaways that I, as, as, as you went through this whole thing that relate to what we do here at Art Center and, you know, how we teach and what we teach, right? Um, collaboration, right? That's a big thing. I mean, you collaborate with a lot of different people, obviously, right? And uh, the, the focus now, as far as, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, design education here at the Art Center is this idea of interdisciplinary uh, projects where you get to, for students to get to, they get to collaborate with other majors on projects, right? And that didn't used to happen before. I don't know, like when you were here and I were here, we didn't, <laughs> no, we didn't do any of that, all. right? So, I so I mean, the idea of collaboration now has really influencing the type of work um, that students are doing now, which is really, really exciting. And I can see that you're doing that at JPL. So, you know, a couple of things that come to mind is the collaboration. Uh, the other two things that came to mind is the idea of materials and prototyping, right? Um, so you get to, you know, it's like, a, you're like a kid in a candy store, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, but more importantly, you got the budgets behind you to be able to do all of this, which is really, really cool. But my question for you is, what would you say to students studying now, especially as far as spatial graphics, immersive graphics and that nature, the things that, that we're, you know, seeing about the future, what would you, what would you say to them? It's like, why would somebody want to do that? And what characteristics do you do you think that they need to have in order to sort of really be passionate and go into these areas where you're taking typographic form, visual form, materials and prototyping and creating these immersive spaces? What would you say to them? Let's see. So just to make sure I understand the question. <laughs> so, so the question is, why, why would you want to do this? Or, yes. or uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Well, yes. I mean, so when when I, the thing that I loved about being at Art Center was that um, uh, so I was in graphic design and most of the conversation was about colors and typefaces and and form. Right. Um, but my friends that were in advertising who couldn't design anything, they had insane ideas and I love the ideas. Right. And then the environmental students, I couldn't understand a word that they wrote because they write all this stuff. <laughs> but But I love the way in which when you would go see or experience something they did, it, it made you feel something. Yeah. And so, so what I try to do is I tried to, I, I really gravitated to those things. I, I wanted something that made you feel that was experiential, that had a powerful idea and it was beautiful. And, and, you know, in all the ways that we were thinking about in, in design. And so that was sort of my, my route to it. I mean, obviously you, you have to find something of, of importance and and meaning in it, and and I think you know as much as VR and all that stuff is is big and and has some interesting things, and until they can um, you know realistically get a lot of your senses, uh, you know, touch a lot of your senses, you know, it's still going to be something that is uh, that falls short, right? And so that's yeah. what I love about experiential work is that you can really you know play with all the different parts of what it means to be human. Right. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, let me, uh, there's a question from Melissa Flower. I'm not sure if she's a, um, a student or not, but she wants to know what resources and other practices would you recommend pursuing, pursuing during our education? So I guess she might be a student in order to stay informed, curious, or inspired by science and technology discussions happening today. Hmm, yeah. Well, I mean, I think ultimately, um, you follow your nose, right? And, and that, uh, you know, as much as, you know, I could tell you to go to this blog or that blog or, or something like that, there is something called Leonardo. Um, uh, if you look up Leonardo and it's like a uh, art and technology um, place in which you can find, you know, a whole bunch of different people doing different things, that that might be one spot to go to. Um, uh, but ultimately, you know, like for me, I just, I just went out and and um, there there wasn't a lot of resources, right? And especially when when I was first kind of doing this, nobody, you know, there there weren't people 
doing very much of this at all. And so, but I, I think, uh, you know, for, uh, if, if you like, there's different levels of science journals and, and some of them are really hard to understand and other ones are, are, uh, less hard to understand. And, and, um, I personally don't actually look at many of them by myself. Um, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, I want to be inspired by other things. And and part of my challenge these days is like, I, I really have to put Instagram and all that stuff down in a way because I feel like I'm kind of being reserved. Like there's a whole feedback loop in there that um, I, you know, if you want to do something original, you can't always be uh, you know, doing everything based upon something else that, you, that you've seen. And, and right. so for me, like the nature thing is, like go to the Huntington Gardens. That's what I would suggest. <laughs> and, and and actually, when I was uh, during the summer, uh, once uh, we actually had our baby, our first baby, um, in between seventh and eighth semester. And uh, fortunately, I was taking that semester off, and I I volunteered at the Huntington Gardens. And um, you know, to me, like if you go to the Cactus Garden, like that is one of the most profound places around because it shows you variations on a theme and um, there's like, you know, 5,000 different cacti there. Yeah. And anytime that you think, Oh, there's no new way of doing something, go look at the cactus garden because you'll realize that it's infinitely possible. Yeah. Um, there was, there's something interesting about the Juno project where you're taking and, you know, uh, trying to uh, communicate with this, satellite and have it send information back to you. And the idea of, of typographic form and typography is an interesting element that comes through in that. And it reminded me of, you know, there's um, in the movie, The Martian, when he's trying to, trying to communicate back to earth, right? And he uses hexadecimals, right? And so this idea of, 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 of coding and prototyping and how we use typographic form in so many ways. And, and, and um, especially here at Art Center, I, I think the idea the focus on typography that we have here and what can be done with it these days, you know what I mean? It's, it's really, really amazing. Um, there's one other question really quickly that somebody uh, added, I think it's Bargy or Barge. Uh, she says, were you always interested in, in space and space navigation? How did this passion and design connect together for you? Uh, no, I mean, I think um, for me, it was really just about um, uh, big ideas. Like that's that's what I'm most interested in is is yeah. big ideas. And um, and I was drawn to um, you know Caltech and the things they were doing there, and and then got this amazing opportunity to to get to meet people and and work here. And and so you know, I could I could probably work in a in an ocean research center or, you know, some, someplace else. But um, uh, ultimately I just, I love big ideas and, and space is, is really a place where you start to question, you know, who you are and what, what all this is about. And, and uh, so I think that's, um, I do love the technology of it. And, and I am really fascinated by like, how in the world do they get to these places? Like everything is spinning and, you know, I'm spinning, the earth is spinning, the spacecraft is spinning. They're orbiting, you know, and and how do they get? How do they land? You know, like right where they're supposed to land. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just want to throw. I threw in the chat um, one thing to watch on the um, Hi Juno thing. There's a second video uh, that's the second one on there, and it shows uh, the actual data, and um, which I think is, is. Is there a link? Yeah, I just put. Uh, okay, yeah, I, you guys. So everyone, he just put it in the link, so you might want to copy that and take a look at that. If I can say, Dan, what I love about the way you think, and I put it in the I put it in the chat that you you use both analog and digital technologies for your problem solving. Yeah. It isn't, you know, you don't go to the computer. And I think that your video showing the uh, cloud was a great example of, you know, trying to figure out a problem sometimes is a combination of different technologies. Right. Yeah. Well, you look if you look at the the Juno project again with yeah. the ham radios. I mean, yeah. most of these students don't know what a ham radio is. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the idea of this of these old this old technology and how it can be repurposed, right? You know, and and prototyping is is really amazing. Yeah, and and, and I think it could go. Yeah. 
that was a great example of um, multidisciplinary thing because we were trying to figure out, well, how could we, can we communicate with the spacecraft somehow? And there was a guy who had an instrument on the spacecraft and he happened yeah. to be a ham radio operator. And he was like, hey, you know, we get all this information but like we also get this little area that does ham radio things. What if we did that? And we're like, you know, I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That it's great. So thank you both. I mean, Ty and and Dan. I hate to say, you know, I wish we can look more at your um, projects. And I know you have many more projects. I don't know if you can put in the chat where people can see some of your other projects that you've done. That would be great. Um, I especially love, and I'm sorry I didn't show the Orbit project. Uh, it's a great, great project. And now everyone's going to have to go look it up because I'm not yes. going to give you the link. It's, <laughs> to it's, on, it's on the website and there's a video about it so they can learn. Yeah, I think it's great. But thank you both. Thank you for um, participating in our space during Creative Tech Week here at Art Center. I think your creative tech is abounds, so to speak. And uh, Ty, thank you again for um, suggesting this series. We yeah. really appreciate it. We have another one yes. next week. Yes. Um, very different. Very different. And uh, I might add, I might say something really quickly about that one, um, uh, which is completely opposite of, it's not about necessarily spatial graphics, but uh, Kenny Gravelis, who is that talk is, he's done some the most iconic music and film posters uh, and music for artists that you guys will all recognize. Um, you guys should definitely come and see that. It's going to be really interesting. They do some really beautiful work there. Right. Well, thank you both again, Dan. As always, you are always amazing and surprising the work that you do and the blending that you do between art, design, science, and technology. It's It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you again. Thanks and all. thank you, everyone. Thanks.